the presentation of today, where we have Guillaume Jacomet, who is uh, somebody I know very well because he works in the same building where the Urbaimging headquarters are. Uh, and uh, he's been working uh, in Turku for, for a while because he, after uh, he finished his PhD in Manchester, he moved here uh, <clears throat> to work with uh, uh, Professor Johanna Ivaska, but he, <clears throat> he has been an independent researcher already for quite a while, as uh, in 2019 <clears throat> he became a PI with his own research group, uh, and he has a cell migration laboratory now um, in the <clears throat> on the second floor in this building where we are. And uh, he's working uh, with lots of mechanisms uh, related to the migration of cells. And you can see some of the structures uh, that he working, he's working with on the picture. So this <clears throat> uh, funny small probing uh, units of the cells, the philopodia, which he has, he has been mapping in, in quite a nice way and, and uh, been actually quite instrumental in, in map, mapping the detailed uh, molecular uh, landscape of the uh, philopodia. And uh, of course, they are interacting with the extracellular matrix and so forth. And uh, Guillaume has been very active also in uh, using artificial intelligence uh, in, uh, in his work and using it to actually develop techniques to analyze what the cells are doing and what are the how the structures are related, <clears throat> their movements, how they're related to the organization of the cell and, and also the same thing at the population level. Uh, so, Guillaume, we very much look forward to your presentation and, and over to you. you. Thanks a lot, John, for, for, the, for the very nice introduction. Uh, so good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for, for joining. It's, it's great to see uh, some, some familiar names in, in the audience. Uh, so I would also like to thank the organizer for giving me the chance of, of showing off some of our uh, recent work uh, here today. Uh, so today I kind of chose a, a, um, a kind of a general title on, on how we are now starting to use deep learning for microscopy uh, to study cancer cell migration and metastasis uh, in, in my lab. Um, okay, so but the, since um, uh, I guess uh, we don't get the chance to kind of interact directly, so I thought I would introduce a little bit from where I'm calling you from. So, so uh, as, as John already mentioned, so I'm working in uh, Finland, in Turku, uh, which is also the, the place of the Europa Imaging uh, headquarter. Uh, so uh, here it's uh, in a complete southern uh, uh, of Finland. And here are kind of two of my images of what Turku looks like in the winter with the river completely frozen and, and the river in, in the summer. And I'm not showing you pictures of what it is like now because basically through my window, I can't actually see much light because it's almost like it's dark outside uh, with, with the beautiful weather that, that John mentioned. Um, okay. So, um, but I hope that we could be able to see many of you uh, in the near future. So we are also organizing uh, uh, the next ELMI meeting in Turku, Finland uh, next year. So in June, uh, uh, next year, 7 and 10 of June. So, so uh, I hope that if you're curious about visiting Turku and you want to come and, and see what it looks like in the summer, which is a good time to visit, then you will consider to, to join ELMI next year. Uh, so so uh, please put that in your calendar and, and it will be great to see you all uh, there. Okay, but now uh, I'll kind of want to now jump in into the, the topic of my presentation and, and the kind of work that, that my lab is doing. Um, and, and one of the main things that we're interested in is to understand cancer metastasis. Um, and so uh, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with this, but, but basically you know that uh, uh, when patients get cancer, the main reason why uh, the disease is uh, life-threatening is because the cancer cells are able to escape the primary tumor in order to disseminate through the body. Um, and um, here what you have are uh, uh, CT scans of patients with prostate cancer. So those, those work was published quite a few years ago now in Nature. And you can see that uh, in this patient, 
Of course, uh, most of the of the tumor that is visible in the CT scan is, of course, in the prostate area because that's where the primary tumor is. But you can also very quickly see that if you look at all the places, then you also have those dark uh, spots, uh, which are the cancer cells that have escaped the primary tumor to disseminate really in, in multiple places in the body. And how the cancer cells are able to do this uh, uh, is still really not so well understood. And it's actually a really complex process. And in this paper, that what they did is that they sequenced the tumors and the different metastatic lesions in order to try to kind of trace back this story of the ability of those cancer cells to leave the primary tumor in order to go to those different uh, sites. And actually, the, the, the picture is relatively complex, where uh, you have basically uh, uh, the primary tumor able to see metastatic lesions, but also metastatic lesions able to see other metastatic lesions. Uh, um, and kind of the history on how the cancer developed is, is really complicated. Uh, and, and still now, uh, we really don't understand how this is regulated at the cellular level. And this is kind of what uh, we are interested to do in, in my lab. Um, and kind of, if we simplify the picture a bit, um, then cancer cell metastasis has uh, several key steps, especially when we, we talk about solid tumors. First, you will have the formation of a, of a primary tumor, which is uh, uh, still encapsulated within the basement membrane. And the basement membrane is so to act as a barrier that stops the cancer cells from, from escaping. Then the cancer cells will somehow be able to breach this basement membrane and to migrate uh, uh, in the surrounding stroma, where they will meet all the type of cells and, and the extracellular matrix. And then they, they, they need uh, to kind of closely interact with this complex environment in order to move uh, forward. Then they will reach the vasculature uh, in the process of intravasation, and then they will somehow survive within the bloodstream or the, uh, in the lymphatics and uh, interact with the endothelial cells at distal sites where they will stop, attach, and they will be able to extravasate to colonize uh, distant organs and form uh, metastatic lesions. Um, and basically what we've been trying to do, so already from my PhD, my postdoc, uh, and then now as, a, as an independent PI, we've been trying to find ways to observe using microscopic technologies how cancer cells are able to do this and what are the processes involved. And, and of course, uh, um, if we kind of start in a very simplified way, it's all about uh, how cells are able to interact with their environment and how they are able to move forward. And then so we can, of course, uh, uh, analyze uh, a migration property of here of, of um, breast cancer cells on a cell-derived matrices scenario where we can uh, uh, grow uh, uh, extracellular matrices produced by fibroblasts and see how cancer cells are interacting with it and how do they migrate and basically uh, analyze the migration movement and then we can start looking at signaling pathways, manipulate your signaling pathways and see uh, how cell migration is regulated. Um, but what we are really interested in is to do a high resolution microscopy in order to kind of uh, start to better understand the type of structures uh, and processes that the cancer cells are using as they're migrating. Uh, so here are some uh, actually old videos, uh, already uh, almost eight years old, uh, looking at uh, um, ovarian carcinoma cells migrating again on cell derived matrices. And then here the actin cytoskeleton is labeled and we were interested in looking at how those uh, uh, spiky phallopodialic protrusions are involved in, in driving the migration forward. Um, and uh, now we're starting to use also uh, uh, slightly more complex systems uh, to look at uh, how cancer cells are behaving in a more in vivo-like environment. And one of the tools that we are currently using in the lab uh, uh, is using zebrafish embryos. And here we have cancer cells that have been injected directly in the vasculature of the zebrafish embryo and trying to understand how the cancer cells are able to, first of all, survive in the vasculature, but also uh, uh, escape. So here is an example of a, of a pancreatic cancer cell that's been labeled for actin. This cell is now stuck in the vasculature, uh, which is here labeled in, in magenta. And then we're trying to understand how the cell is able to interact with the vasculature, but also to escape. And this is work done by uh, Gauthier Follin in my lab. Um, so, so basically, uh, what we're trying to do is to use various microscopy techniques in order to observe how cancer cells are able to move in various environments. Um, and uh, as I'm sure most of you are quite familiar with, uh, one of the big problems that we have come from uh, uh, the big frustration of microscopy, uh, which I, uh, I call the pyramids of frustration, uh, both related to data acquisition and data analysis. 
The first one related to data acquisition is, uh, of course, we want to look at how cancer cells move. So we need to do live cell imaging in order to study the processes involved. And however, uh, uh, when it starts to kind of become a problem is that uh, when you start doing live cell imaging, then you need to start making compromises because we of course want the best spatial resolution, the uh, uh, highest temporal resolution, but we want also really high contrast. Uh, we want to image a lot of uh, uh, events and we also want to keep our sample very happy and that everyone uh, is uh, surviving so that the things that we are observing is uh, relevant. And uh, it's actually surprisingly uh, challenging still to, to do all of these things, uh, because very often, then if we start to do a thing at high resolution, then either uh, as a specimen health is compromised, or then we need to compromise quite a lot in the temporal resolution. Uh, um, but then we also have a big problem on the data analysis side, where again, there's a, a kind of a, a frustration where we want to maximize biological insight from our images. We want to learn as much as possible, get numerical data, and be able to, to classify all those uh, uh, in the proper way. Uh, but at the same time, we don't want to spend a lot of time working out uh, an uncrafted image analysis pipeline to answer specific problems. We want to have some things that kind of work already out of the box. Uh, and uh, ideally, we will want to do it in a high throughput way, uh, uh, in the sense that both the analysis is fast, but also that we can analyze a large amount of data uh, rapidly. And of course, we want our analysis to be accurate. We, we want to have uh, uh, good results from our images. And uh, again, from the data analysis side, from the images that we generate, it's surprisingly difficult still to have uh, uh, um, a good compromise across those different categories. Um, and so because of that, uh, trying to kind of uh, get more out of our microscopy images, and we started to look into uh, um, implementing uh, deep learning methods to analyze our microscopy images. And again, some things that you've probably been uh, aware of is that for the last maybe two to three years, there's really been now an explosion of uh, techniques uh, uh, um, that have been released uh, by, by developers on how to use different deep learning architectures to answer or analyze microscopy images. Uh, so so um, about two to two years ago, uh, we started to kind of really wanted to use those technology to help us with analyzing our images of migrating cells. Um, so, so the first things that uh, I want to discuss a little bit about is uh, what is the difference between a deep learning uh, algorithm, let's say, and, and a more classical algorithm that, that you will use to analyze microscopy images. Um, and um, one of the first things when you use a classical algorithm, and here, for instance, it's an example related to denoising microscopy data. Um, so when you have a noisy image and then you want to denoise it, then you will use uh, um, a specific uh, uh, mathematical functions that will try to remove the noise. So that's typically how classical algorithm uh, tend to work is that you apply a specific uh, uh, a set of mathematical transformation in order to, uh, to denoise it. However, deep learning algorithm work a little bit in a different way, in the sense that uh, um, you will have developers that have, uh, will have created a, a, a deep learning uh, architectures uh, that, that can be used. And then when you want to use those, uh, of course, you can create your own, but, but uh, uh, as biologists, typically, uh, we, we start by uh, using the ones that are already existing. Um, and when we want to use those, uh, what we, we need to do is first to provide a training data set to the computer software in order to teach it what we want to do with our microscopy images. So here, in, in the case of, of, uh, of training a, a deep learning model to do denoising, we will provide noisy images and images with a high signal to noise ratio. Uh, um, and then we will provide that to the, to the deep learning algorithm that will then use those images to learn how to transform this image in the noisy image into the high quality images. Okay, and then once you've trained that model, then you can use it with, for other images uh, to, to directly apply them. So uh, a kind of a in, a in a bit more simplified way, typically when you use classical algorithms then you will uh, uh, use a one step process where you have your data and then you press uh, the software to analyze them. Typically in deep learning, if you start using it, you first need to train a model to do what you want. And then once you have the model, then it's kind of a, a one click solution in order to, to, do, to do that. So, um, but why, why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting because typically, uh, 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 the main advantage of deep learning model 
is that uh, they are really performance. You basically uh, ask a computer to optimize an image analysis task based on the training data sets. So in this case, uh, uh, you basically, uh, the computer is, is finding the best way of denoising your images based on the data you give it. Uh, so that typically leads to really good performance. And then once you have a, a, a train model that does what you want it to do, then it's really uh, almost a magic button solution where you can apply now this analysis to, to a lot of your images uh, in a very rapid and straightforward way, which solve a lot of the issues that, that we might have had before. Uh, if you remember the kind of a beta analysis a pyramid of frustration, where now we can try to get really good accuracy uh, in our analysis and make it fast and in a way that is uh, really user-friendly. Um, but the, the main issue here is, uh, of course, the model is only as good as what the data, uh, as the data that the ones have been used to train it. So here is an example where we have uh, here a ground truth. Here are some noisy data we can train here. Uh, uh, so here is a care model uh, um, trained on the right type of data, and you can get really good denoising from those images. Um, here is an example of using pure denoise, which is a kind of a classical algorithm. And you can see that you can still get much nicer results here using uh, care rather than using uh, pure denoise. However, if you've trained your deep learning model on something that's not relevant, or if you download something that you found on the web that you don't even know what it was trained on, then it's likely that the results are not going to be what you want, and you might not get very good results. So, so just to highlight that here in this case, uh, with deep learning, you can solve a lot of those analysis problems, but then it's important to, to, to make sure that the model is working the way you want. And, and one of the important parts here is uh, uh, training it on the right data. Um, and uh, when we started uh, uh, kind of playing with deep learning about two years ago, uh, that's kind of where we, we started having issues. Um, and the main reason for that is that training a deep learning model is not always that straightforward. So, so typically first, what you need to do is that you need to install the right software and dependencies in order to be able to use those uh, existing deep learning toolboxes. Very often uh, you will have uh, Python codes uh, that needs to be modified uh, in order to be able to use it. And then uh, uh, you, of course, also need access to quite a lot of uh, computing powers in order to, to, uh, uh, to use uh, uh, deep learning. So, so the, the training of a deep learning models uh, require a lot of uh, computing power. So all of these things kind of create uh, a barrier for, for uh, at least for us, uh, to kind of start using uh, deep learning to analyze our microscopy images. So that's when we kind of uh, started uh, working. So that's kind of how I felt when I started playing with deep learning models about two years ago, uh, and when I tried to, first of all, install the right dependencies uh, uh, so that uh, um, the, my Python would um, recognize my graphic card so that I could get started using the, the tools. And that was not that easy. And so because of that, we thought that it would be a, a better way of getting started. And that's where we started working on uh, what we call zero cost deep learning for microscopy projects. Uh, and here are, are the list of people that are involved in this project with, with the core team uh, uh, being uh, um, uh, a, a close collaboration with Ricardo Enriquez's group, uh, um, first in London and now is, is in uh, Portugal, with Lucas and Romain being the uh, two of the main developers of, of the project. But a lot of people have been involved in, in the platform since then. So, so you, you can find them here. Uh, it really takes a village to, to develop uh, this type of, of tools. Um, so but what is zero cost deep learning for microscopy? So basically now imagine you have a computer, which uh, uh, I guess most people uh, wanted to analyze images have. And then you have uh, images that you want to analyze. You also need, of course, uh, training data to train deep learning models. Um, and then basically you can, uh, using uh, the platform, you can upload all your data to uh, Google Drive or another online uh, uh, um, platform to store the data. And then we provide a Jupyter Notebook that are uh, designed to work with a platform called Google Collab, which is a free platform that provides computing power to, to play with, with deep learning provided by, by Google. Um, and um, with these notebooks, you can uh, train your network and then you can make directly and use those network uh, in, in the cloud. So you don't need access to any kind of 
a, a, a powerful computer. You don't need to install anything on your own computer and you don't need to code anything. So everything happens in, in the clouds and then uh, we provide everything you need as being part of the Google Collab notebooks. And then you can, of course, download everything that you've produced for further analysis on, on your own computer. Um, so, so what does the platform provide? Then you have free cloud access to GPU, kindly provided by, by Google. So, but then again, here with, with this limitation, uh, you have a simple user interface, so you don't need to do any coding if you don't want to. If you want to modify the underlying code, you can do that as well. And it's a single platform for training, prediction, and most importantly, for quality control. So then there is uh, a specific steps within the, the, the Google Collab notebooks that we provide so that you can validate the, the models that you've trained uh, using your data and assess their quality. Um, so, so this is a video that we released uh, about uh, now almost a year ago when we, when we first released the platform, just to give you a flavor of the kind of thing you can do using uh, zero cost uh, deep learning for microscopy. Um, and um, but basically, you can do things like segmentation uh, using UNET. So here is an example of segmentation of electron microscopy images. You can use uh, networks such as TARDIS to do detect nuclei or other uh, rounded objects uh, and follow them over time. Uh, you can uh, also, uh, so here, both for 2D and 3D images, you can also do some object detection. So for instance, here using YOLO to detect different cellular states. Uh, if you're interested in denoising applications, so we have several notebooks dedicated for denoising. So here's an example of, of noise to voids that we'll show you again a little bit more later in the talk. Uh, if you're interested in uh, a CSB deep care for image restoration, so here again, uh, uh, there's a notebook for that, which can be really useful again for denoising live cell imaging data. If you're interested in super resolution microscopy, we also have notebooks for that. So here it's analysis of single molecule localization microscopy data. And then there's some uh, a little bit more out of the box type of deep learning application for microscopy, uh, which is uh, um, image to image translation. So how to predict a label from another one using things like FNET or pix to pix for instance, or here cycle GAN on how you cycle GAN to improve uh, um, resolution of, of microscopy images. So just to give you a flavor of some of the things that are, that are possible. Um, so I don't want to spend too much time on the platform, but here it's basically uh, an example of what our wiki page look like, which is basically a collection of, of Jupyter notebooks that have dedicated applications. And so at the moment we have uh, 31 notebooks and then we will release new one uh, probably next week. So, so that if you're interested, then keep, keep an eye out for that. But so basically notebooks to do a lot of different types of things uh, that you might want to do with your microscopy images from segmentation to denoising to image to image translation and, and so on. And also uh, uh, notebooks for doing joint denoising and segmentation and, and you can do several of those tasks uh, together. But what I wanted to talk more about today is how do we use it for our own research in, in cancer migration and, and how, what, what, does, uh, what can you do with, with, with that? Um, and there I kind of want to kind of take one small step back in what can you do with deep learning? And actually almost any type of image analysis that you can think of uh, can be done now using uh, deep learning uh, algorithms that have already been released. That goes from you know, segmentation to denoising to, to almost any kind of things you can think of. And now I'll show you a few examples based on, on, on those categories uh, on how we've been using those, those tools to, to aid our work on cancer cell migration. Um, and the first thing I kind of want to, to, to tell a little bit more about is about denoising and how denoising is really important for, for live cell imaging. And again, I'm sure that you, you probably all know this, but lasers are quite toxic for cells, right? So that's, that's not groundbreaking, but it's maybe something that's still ignored quite a lot uh, uh, in, in, the, in the lab, which means that you need to use low laser power when you want to do fluorescence microscopy. Um, and then if you want to follow something, you need to, to label it. So very often you need to have a protein that's labeled with maybe a fluorescent microscopy uh, with a fluorescent molecule in order to be able to see it. And, and typically people will do that by let's say overexpressing a plasmid. But then the problem is that if you put too much of your protein of interest in the cell, so that you can see it, then most likely you're gonna affect the cell behavior. So what you want is to have a really low expression of your, of your protein of interest. And ideally you want to tag the endogenous uh, molecule. 
However, uh, endogenous molecules are not that easy to see just because there's not actually that many proteins within the cells, which means that if you combine those two things together, you need to use low laser power with endogenous or low expression levels, you almost always will get noisy images. Uh, and if you don't get any noisy images at all, uh, then you might need to start thinking whether you start having one of those things with uh, a little bit too much. So either too much laser power or, or too much expression of your, of your molecule of interest. And because of that, denoising application can be really, really helpful. So here is a kind of an example on how we've used noise to voids uh, to denoise uh, uh, migrating cells. So here we have uh, gliomas that have been labeled for paxillin. And here we're looking at the endogenous paxillin. Um, the cells are also not plated on the cover slips, they're plated on uh, polyacrylamid gels of a defined stiffness. So we wanted to look at how stiffness is involved uh, uh, in the migration capability of the cells. So it's not the easiest type of microscopy that you can do. And, and by uh, using uh, this type of denosing approach, we were able to much better resolve the focal adhesion structure in these cells. Uh, and, and in this case, what we really wanted to do was to correlate how those focal adhesion uh, match the amount of forces that the cell are exerted on their substrate using here traction force microscopy. Uh, so, so here we've been using super resolution traction force microscopy uh, to, to do that, to try to match back where the cell adhesion sites are related to the amount of forces exerted by the cells. So if you want to know more about this, it's something we've published uh, uh, last year, and I will be happy to, to discuss it more if you're, if you're interested. Um, and uh, that's one of the nice thing about the zero cost platform is that we've now implemented quite a few different type of deep learning based denoising approach that have been released by, by various group around the world. And uh, now by using the same data set, you can start now testing those different approaches and find the best denoising, the best network to denoise your images for your specific data sets. Uh, and uh, using the quality metrics that are implemented within the notebook to give you an idea on how well your, your denosing is working, then you can start using the best tool possible for, for your application. So here in this case, care was giving slightly better images than noise to voice or decoloising for the specific data set. Um, the other thing that we are doing quite a bit in the lab is to do live cell imaging uh, using SIM, so structural elimination microscopy. Uh, and uh, if you read the textbook, including the one that, that uh, we've been involved in writing, uh, you will read that SIM is, is a live uh, a friendly application. So you can do nice live cell imaging using for SIM because it's quite live cell friendly. But the truth is that SIM is more live cell friendly than some of the other super resolution technique. But actually when you're using SIM, you still are bombarding the cells with quite a lot of laser power in order to be able to, to do your, your experiments. And uh, doing long-term live cell imaging using SIM is, is actually is quite difficult if you want to image for a very long time. Um, so, so very often, if you do that, then you end up having uh, uh, either samples that bleach over time, or then you'll kill your sample, or then you need to use uh, an elimination regime where your SIM images is quite noisy. So here is an example on how we looked at phallopodia in between cancer cells. Uh, uh, using SIM and the, the raw data is quite noisy. And then, then here using uh, CSB deep care uh, implemented in zero cost, then we've been able to kind of uh, better recover the structures uh, uh, involved in, in between these cells. Um, and then here, one of the tricks that, that we've been uh, using to do that is that basically we, we train the deep learning model using data set acquired using fixed samples. So this is not something that will necessarily work for everyone, but here in this case, it worked quite nicely, where we are able to, to generate training data sets using a, a fixed data set, where there it's much easier to blast the sample with high laser power and get a, a nice seam reconstructions. Uh, um, so then that way we, we were able to train care in reconstructing the actin structures in, in those kind of more noisy images uh, uh, um, in, a, in a much nicer way. Uh, so you can see that you can get rid of a lot of the noise and then you better recover the, the structures. Um, the other things that we have been using in our work to, to try to understand uh, cancer cell invasion, especially in vivo. So I was, I was telling you briefly in, in the introduction that we, we are uh, using zebrafish embryo for our research. And one of the things that we've been struggling with for a while is that uh, when we do many experiments in zebrafish embryo, the zebrafish embryo are very similar to one to another, but they're not similar enough that it's that easy to align all the images in order to create uh, uh, maps of where the cancer cells are in the zebrafish embryo. 
So one of the things that we've been using is deep learning to do uh, uh, um, AI-based registration technologies that are used a lot in the medical imaging fields uh, uh, in order to analyze, uh, to align, for instance, CT scans uh, uh, between patients. So we've implemented uh, something called Dr. Mim uh, in, in zero cost in order to specifically register our microscopy images. And here is an example on how we aligned uh, multiple images of zebrafish embryo so that we now are able to better compare results uh, from uh, different experiments uh, using uh, this setting. Um, another application that I was mentioning is uh, uh, image to image translation. So how we can now, uh, using deep learning, especially using GANs, uh, predict what a label will look like from another one. So here is an example where we are uh, some uh, raw data are acting. Here we are, uh, images of uh, uh, cancer cells that are labeled for, for cell DNA to visualize the nuclei. And then here we've trained peaks to peaks uh, which is a deep learning algorithm that, uh, that is uh, quite popular on the web to, to uh, uh, predict uh, what a cat would look like or what uh, um, uh, from, from drawing, for instance, but you can also use it for, for microscopy images. Here we've been able to train the model to predict what images uh, of, of nuclei would look like just based of, on the actin. So then we give to the algorithm images of actin and then uh, the, the, the software predicts on, on what the nuclei would look like. And, and the, correspondence, the correspondence with the real images of, of uh, DNA is actually really good. So, so then you, you almost have 100% matching. The main uh, issue is that uh, the, the deep learning model here is not able to predict the, the orientation of the spindle and dividing cells uh, accurately. Uh, so then here you have uh, changes in, in the orientation of the mitotic spindles, but for the positioning and the size and the shape of the nuclei, the prediction are, are very robust. Um, so that's the kind of thing we're doing. Um, but one of the things that we are also very interested in uh, is of course tracking. Right, so, so we do a lot of migration experiments looking at how cancer cells move. Uh, um, and one of the main things that we are doing with those experiments is of course looking at their shape, but also to be able to track them in order to look at uh, how uh, and get quantitative data on their migration pattern. Uh, and it's uh, something that I spent most of my PhD in was to click on cells in Fiji to do manual tracking. And uh, um, we kind of thought that now using deep learning, there must be a much better way of, of uh, doing those kind of tracking experiments. And actually there's been quite a few algorithm released in, in the past two years on how to use deep learning to do automatic tracking, both in 2D and, and 3D data set. Um, but my lab has been uh, teaming up with uh, Jean-Yves Tinevez uh, from uh, Pasteur in, in Paris, uh, who is one of the main developers of TrackMate, which is a very popular uh, a Fiji plugin to do uh, tracking. Uh, um, in order to uh, bring a lot of those uh, machine learning and deep learning components directly into TrackMate, so that you can now use uh, certain type of, of deep learning models or deep learning outputs uh, directly into TrackMate in order to track cells or, or the object you're interested in. So this is work uh, um, that was done uh, a lot by, by Jean-Yves, myself, and, and Joanna in, in my lab uh, uh, working on, on this new version of, of TrackMate. And why exactly what uh, now, so we've released it uh, maybe two months or three months ago, and, uh, and it's on, on a preprint describing it on BioArchive if you're interested. But the, the main thing now is that you can now import a lot of different uh, results or, or models uh, directly into TrackMate in order to track objects. So if you're, in, if you're using VECA, for instance, to segment your favorite objects or Elastic or, or deep learning model like Stardist or CellPose to segment your, your uh, favorite uh, structures, and now you can directly uh, in, incorporate uh, uh, those results into TrackMate in order to track them and get a lot of quantitative information now about the shapes, the size, and the changes in those things over time in, from, your, from your movies, which is really helpful for, for our work. So here is an example, so not from cancer cells, I will show you an example from cancer cells soon, but here is an example on how we've used uh, a Stardist to detect uh, uh, um, uh, uh, T cells here that are migrating on the cover slips. Uh, and uh, Stardis can detect them, and then we now use after that TrackMate in order to, to track them over time. And this approach can be really powerful because now instead of, uh, of manually tracking some of those objects, then you can be done really quickly and in a really automated manner. And then again, thinking of the pyramid of frustration, now the data is also extremely accurate. Uh, uh, so so um, 
it's kind of kind of really simplify some of our analysis problems. Um, here is, a, is another example from uh, migrating cancer cells, uh, where we've now used cell pools to automatically track uh, these uh, cancer cells in, in monolayer. So here's a cell pools model worked quite well out of the box. We didn't need to, to retrain it. Uh, and then uh, using the, the result from cell pose, we can uh, give those to track mates as labeled image and then track mate can now track them automatically. And then again, now it's allow us to track uh, thousands, thousands and thousands of cells per movie and, and to follow their shape, size and et cetera uh, uh, over time to better understand uh, a collective cell migration in, in cancer cells. Um, and something that is still very much work in progress is one of the things that we're also really interested in is how cancer cells are interacting with the vasculature. So it's also a really important part of the metastatic cascade is how cancer cell can attach to endothelial cells in order to extravasate and in order to, to form metastatic lesion. And one of the tools uh, that we, we use for that is we have microfluidic chambers where we perfuse cancer cells on top of endothelial cells, and we are uh, following uh, as well. So here it's labeled free imaging, just bright field images. Uh, and basically what we do is now we use uh, a star distant track mates in order to, to detect specifically the cancer cells in those movies so that we detect only the, the, the cancer cells and not uh, the endothelial cells. And then we can then track them. So then we can find the cells that are attached to the endothelial cells versus the cells that are uh, flowing. Uh, and that allow us to extract only the cells that are attaching even, even for a brief period of time. So that kind of now uh, allow us to kind of analyze, again, hundreds of movies in different conditions from those liver free images in order to, to get quantitative information on how cancer cells are interacting with endothelial cells on the flow. And, and then we can even go uh, a little bit further because now we can also train uh, um, deep learning models in order to predict where the cell cell junctions and where the nuclei will be in the endothelial cells. So then we can get even more information from our bright field images. Uh, and then we can then extract uh, 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 using instant segmentation where the cell cell junctions are and the nuclei are from those fake predicted images. And then we can put all of those data together uh, uh, and create our uh, kind of uh, eight bit video game type uh, movies where we can look at where the cancer cells are attaching in respect to the endothelial cells, nuclei and junctions in order to, to get information about those processes. And again, looking at how those things are, are now changes if you manipulate the, the system. So, so hopefully this kind of gives you a flavor of some of the things that we are doing uh, uh, using deep learning and how it's helping us uh, to, to study cancer cell migration and, and metastasis, both in vitro and, and in vivo. And uh, I just wanted to kind of briefly uh, highlight those two uh, preprints that came out this week that are building on top of the zero cost uh, platform. Uh, so one is dedicated for uh, bacterial image analysis. So if you're interested in kind of things, uh, so, so uh, Christoph Spann and, and uh, Ricardo Henriquez's group has really a really nice toolbox dedicated uh, for, for uh, bacterial image analysis using zero cost deep learning for microscopy. Um, and there's another tool that was also released now from uh, Martin Prisner and, and Roma Lane, uh, uh, using again, uh, so building on top of zero cost, uh, but now developing new algorithm that, are, uh, that now can be used to do frame interpolation. So then here you can now using those tools predict missing frame in your uh, time lapses. So, so let's say you are imaging uh, every, two, you know, every minute, then now you can start using those deep learning tools to try to predict the information that is in between the images that you have acquired. And uh, this kind of tool will be really useful, especially uh, if you're doing live cell imaging uh, or even if you're doing uh, 3D imaging because it's also work for, for stacks in order to predict uh, uh, data sets and improve, for instance, uh, uh, live cell imaging. So maybe now if the, those models are really accurate, then maybe we don't need to image as often and then preserving the, the sample uh, uh, life better. So um, if you're interested to contribute to zero cost deep learning for microscopy, please do so. We are very happy to, to engage with all of you. Uh, just reach out and, and uh, check out our uh, web pages. Um, so on that, I just want to, to thank the whole uh, zero-cost deep learning for microscopy team. As I said, it really takes a village to put all of these things together. 
um, and I hope that you you will find it useful for also your work. And then one thing that you might find is that actually it's a nice entryway into the deep learning for microscopy world. And then as then once some of the limitation uh, um, uh, that that Google Collab uh, kicks in, then you might start to kind of further develop it yourself so that you can use those tools locally using your own uh, uh, computational resources. And, and then if I have another uh, 10 minutes, I kind of want to uh, switch uh, gear a little bit. And so if Mariana, so that you kind of reopen the, the, the video, um, just to tell you a little bit about uh, some of our uh, kind of cell biological work uh, um, instead of just talking about uh, image analysis. And it's a, a story uh, that has been developing in collaboration with Emilia Peu and, and Joanna Ivaskas group uh, here in, in Turku. And here, it's one of the things that we're really interested in is to try to understand how cancer cells breach through basement membrane in order to reach uh, uh, and innovate locally. And, and it's in the context of breast cancer. So something that, again, you probably know is that for the vast majority of breast cancer, you will have a, a, a first uh, um, the formation of, or, uh, of ductal carcinoma in situ, where you have uh, uh, the breast cancers that are still encapsulated by your basement membrane. So you have basically hyperproliferation of, of the uh, uh, epithelial cells, and that kind of filling the duct in, in the breast. And uh, that stage is typically not life-threatening. Some of them don't even require any intervention. But the problem is that when those DCIS turns into invasive carcinoma, and then the cancer cells are able to bridge through the basement membrane to invent locally and start to, to, uh, to make metastatic lesion. And, and uh, one of the things that we've been using in the lab is a model called DCIS.com, which are cells that we can inject into animal models uh, uh, in order to generate those uh, uh, DCIS. So here is an example uh, where uh, uh, at an early time point, you can see that the tumor is still encapsulated within the basement membrane and it's polarized, uh, has not invaded yet locally in the, in the mouse stroma. Uh, but if you wait uh, a few more days, so, so uh, uh, two, two weeks more, you can see that the, the now the, the cells have escaped uh, from, the, from the DCIS and started to invade. Um, and one of the things that we've noticed is that if you look at those cells migrating in, in vitro, is that they form a lot of those phallopodia-like protrusions as they are they invading forward. So then we really wanted to, to look at what is the role of those protrusions in, in uh, uh, breast cancer dissemination in vivo. And so one of the molecules that we've been working on is myosin 10, which is a phallopodia protein. Uh, uh, and basically all you need to know about it is that it uh, decorates the tip of the phallopodia. And then if you remove myosin 10, then those uh, phallopodia -like structures are reduced in the cell. It's quite important in breast cancer. So, so if you look at myosin expression in patient samples and patients with, with high level of myosin 10 tend to do uh, less well than patients with, with low level of myosin 10. And then previous work from, from the Ivaska group has shown that if you remove myosin 10 in, in aggressive uh, um, breast cancer uh, uh, models, then you decrease the ability of the cancer cells to, to disseminate. And really the things that we wanted to answer is what is the role of myosin and phallopodia in, in DCIS progression? So I, I'm, I'm just gonna uh, take maybe five minutes to, to answer that so that we, we have time for maybe discussion afterwards. But the first thing I wanted to show you is that uh, we've been using RNA scope from a fresh patient sample to look at the expression of myosin 10. And what we found is that myosin 10 expression is upregulated in the DCIS uh, in patients. And if you look in the same patient in the kind of healthy area, which is a bit further away from the tumor, there's very little myosin 10 expression detected using uh, RNA scope. So at least it's relevant to look at myosin 10 expression. So we've silenced myosin 10 in these cells. Uh, uh, so this is what it looks like in a control condition where you have those long phallopodia that are used by the cell to probe their environment. And then if you remove myosin 10, then you lose a lot of those uh, structures. And then uh, we've now uh, look at how those cells are migrating and what kind of behavior uh, uh, when you remove phallopodia. And here now it's tracking using star descent track method that I was showing you earlier. And what we found is that we have a, a small reduction in, this, in the speed of migration in, in these cells when we remove uh, uh, phallopodia. It's not a huge reduction, but it's, it's uh, still quite significant. And then we put those cells, uh, let's skip this, and then we put those cells um, in vivo and look at how they uh, behave uh, when we grow tumors in, in the mouse model. 
And surprisingly, what we found is that, of course, we, we form tumors in both the control and the silence, but we found that when we remove myosin 10, uh, so those phallopodia inducing protein, what we have is that the tumors are actually more invasive. And, and we've been since then exploring, uh, uh, trying to understand why this is the case. And the first thing that we've looked at is, of course, the basement membrane. So remember from the introduction, I was telling you that the basement membrane is what uh, is supposed to contain the tumors in those DCIS so that the cell cannot escape. And what we found is that here in the control condition, you have a really nice basement membrane here labeled at the edges of the DCIS labeled here with collagen 4. But then if you remove myosin 10, then that uh, uh, basement membrane is, is mostly missing. Looking at uh, other extracellular matrix molecules associated with basement membranes, such as fibronectin, is nicely remodeled here in, in, the, um, in the control, but then it's mostly again missing in the silence. Um, so here is kind of a higher resolution of the same thing. So, so looking at again fibronectin, and you can see that in the silence condition, the fibronectin doesn't assemble nice fibrin in vivo, instead, it's, it's forming those kind of uh, uh, circular uh, structures. And so when you don't really know what to do next, then you typically goes for omic approach. So here we did some RNA sequencing to try to understand what was going on in these tumors and why the basement membrane wasn't assembled properly. And so here was a nice thing about our setup is that we have human cells inside of a mouse, which means that using RNA of the tumor, if we do RNA sec of the tumor, we can differentiate changes in gene in the stroma versus changes in gene in the, in the tumor itself. And most of the gene change only in the tumor and not in the stroma. So we looked at that in a bit more details. And again, to cut a long story short, we found that in the silence condition, most of the genes that are responsible for producing extracellular matrix molecule, including basement membrane, are actually upregulated. So it's not a problem in producing those basement membrane uh, because all, uh, at least the transcripts, are there. Then we looked at, uh, went back to microscopy, trying to understand how uh, DCIS tumors assemble basement membrane. And for that, we developed an assay where we mixed those spheroids uh, together with fluorescently labeled molecules in order to look at basement membrane remodeling uh, in, in uh, 3D and spheroids. And this is what we found is that when you mix here, for instance, collagen uh, using uh, um, in the setup, we can see that phallopodia uh, uh, are uh, going up to there, but then the spheroid assemble a nice uh, ECM molecule layer around the spheroid. Um, and we can also do that live. So here are some data denoise using deconoising. Uh, in zero cost. Um, and then you can see, again, looking at fibronectin, and here looking at actin to look at phallopodia, we can see that the spheroid are able to, to deposit and assemble a nice uh, layer of SEM molecules around the spheroid. However, when we remove myosintan, what we found is that uh, a lot of those remodeling doesn't happen. So then uh, there's less phallopodia, but then it doesn't look like the cells are able to grab the ECM and remodel it properly around the spheroid in, in vitro. And we think that is likely one of the main mechanisms why uh, uh, in vivo as well, you don't have a, a really nice formation of basement membrane that can kind of keep the tumors contained. And we've also done some uh, ex vivo imaging of the tumor. So then here it's taking the tumor out of the mouse and then putting it straight away under the microscope to look at what it looks like. And what we found is that uh, basically, uh, uh, when we look at the control tumor here, they are able to extend a lot of protrusions at the border of the DCIS. So it's going to zoom in in a, in a second. So you can see those a bit better. Uh, uh, however, those protrusions seems to be really defective in, in the silence condition. So you can see that you, you have those really long extension at the border of the tumor uh, 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 when we look at the dynamic of the cells in, in these tumors. Uh, um, so, so those are not phallopodia, they are much bigger, they're a lot like uh, pseudopods, uh, uh, but somehow those are structure are defective when we remove uh, myosin 10. So here is an example for a myosin 10 video. So I think I'm running a bit out of time, so I will maybe not play the whole video, but uh, basically uh, um, when we looked at those myosin 10 tumor in live ex vivo, then the, the, uh, uh, um, we really don't see any of those protrusions being formed. So suggesting that myosin 10 is important there in this context. So the cells are moving, they're happy, but they're just not protruding in, in the surrounding stroma. Okay, so here is kind of a brief take home message for the second part of my talk when I've shown you that myositin regulates phallopodia in these DCIS.com cells. And then it looks like those uh, phallopodia, it seems to contribute to basement membrane integrity in, in vivo. 
Uh, and those phallopodia are also important to regulate ECM remodeling in 3D sphere rates, and that myosin tape contribute to cell protrusion in vivo. And now we kind of start to, to think of all of this as a, as a model on how basically a breast cancer cell a protrusion activity is important in uh, keeping uh, cancer cells in, in check in the right environment. And uh, it also, if you remember, maybe some contradictory results from what I've shown you in the introduction, that myosin 10 was important for, for dissemination. And maybe we think that it is important, but at the later stage of the metastatic cascade, uh, when the cells have already escaped the, the primary tumor. Uh, if you're interested to hear a little bit more about this work, we've also put it on bioarchive, so feel free to have a look, because uh, they have been a little bit fast in, in the presentation. On that, I just want to finish by uh, um, acknowledging all the funding bodies that support our work, uh, but also our own uh, organizations that provide us with uh, microscopes uh, um, and facilities that allow us to do our work, and uh, my lab for, for all the great work that I've uh, shown you today. And on that, I would be happy to take any question. And sorry if I'm overrun a little bit. Thanks, Guillaume, a lot and a really nice